Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. It is a mess of mixed messages as we near the start of the school year. Should schools allow students into class? And who's able to actually make that decision? The confusion coming as Bear County sees a sharp rise in COVID-19 cases and deaths. More than 1,500 new COVID-19 cases were added in Bear County for a total nearing 38,000. And 12 more deaths were reported today for a total of 335. The school districts in Bear County were told to start the year off with virtual learning and continue until after Labor Day in an attempt to slow the spread of COVID-19. But a letter from the the state attorney general and backpedaling by the Texas Education Agency is leading to pushback. And tonight we are learning of lawsuits. The night team's Patty Santos tells us this back and forth has many asking who should parents and students listen to? In the middle of a pandemic, <laughs> listen to the medical experts. Correct. Frustration coming from local leaders after the Texas Education Agency updated its guidance today saying it will not fund school districts that keep classrooms closed because of a local health mandate. Now districts that want to continue with distance learning past four weeks must get TEA approval. The update was just hours after Attorney General Ken Paxton issued non-binding guidance that local health officials have no authority to keep schools closed. At some point, we have to start asking who's in charge over there. You have so many mixed messages about something that's very simple with regard to the safety of the school populations. Paxton's message very different from Governor Greg Abbott's message during a press conference today. When dealing with a pandemic with a constantly changing coronavirus, it's important that government be as nimble as the coronavirus. And hence, we will maintain that flexibility in our education system, understanding that the first and foremost priority in this education year is going to be the health and safety of students, teachers, and parents. But even locally, the decision to delay the start of in-person school has gotten some pushback. Cornerstone Christian Schools filed a lawsuit against the city and county. The city says it has started meeting with religious and private schools to get them on board prior to the lawsuit. There's no attempt at all to stifle any religious messaging or any re or practice of religion uh, and so our hope is that the the schools will see that and again voluntarily comply two weeks ago abbott said the decision to reopen schools would be a local level decision every time it seems that our attorney general appears on the scene during this pandemic it creates confusion and chaos and it leaves a wake and that confusion and chaos uh, could cost lives this fall. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. And Northside ISD Superintendent Dr. Brian Woods alluded to possible legal action as the health directive was brought into question, but the district says currently no litigation is in process. Meanwhile, the Bernie ISD, which has two schools that actually are in Bear County, released letters to parents saying, quote, based on the AG's legal guidance, that's the attorney general, both Fair Oaks Ranch and Van Robb Elementary Schools will be allowed to open as scheduled on August 12th with both in-person and e-learning along with our remaining 10 schools, end quote. San Antonio City Attorney Andy Segovia said the state attorney general's guidance is non-binding in his opinion. Mayor Ron Nuremberg tonight reminding residents in outlying areas in the region they are served by the same hospitals that are being stressed by COVID-19. At last check, Judge Nelson Wolf saying 20 to 25 percent of people in local hospitals were from outside of Bear County. Tonight we have 12 percent of staffed hospital beds available in our area. 1,045 people in the hospital, 413 people are in the intensive care unit, 283 on ventilators tonight. Put an over-the-counter supplement ease the symptoms of COVID-19. A Medina County doctor is using melatonin in addition to other medication to help patients recover from the virus faster. The night team's Patty Santos tells us about the doctor and why he's urging other medical experts to consider its use. Dr. Richard Neal is a retired colonel, a former Air Force chief flight surgeon and an aerospace medical expert. He says he started studying the effects of melatonin some 20 years ago as a counter use on bioweapons. Melatonin is an amazing molecule that has antitoxin, antioxidant and 
modulates the immune system. Weighs much like the hydroxychloroquine, but but it's much easier to titrate the melatonin. When COVID-19 patients walk in to see Dr. Richard Neal, he starts them off with melatonin, the sleep aid also known for its anti-inflammatory effects. It's way better at stopping that overreaction of the immune system that leads to the cytokine storm. And that's basically how it works. Treatments vary depending on each patient, but vitamin C and D3 might also be included in addition to antibiotics and steroids. But he thinks the key is melatonin. But I've been in contact with many of the leading researchers on melatonin, and yeah, melatonin was actually recommended for use with the original SARS and MERS and other viruses like West Nile virus. Since the start of the pandemic, he's treated a couple of hundred patients. Only two, he says, needed to be hospitalized, but were not serious cases. I'm actually getting more and more colleagues who actually have tried it, and I'm getting lots of feedback that says, wow, this stuff really does work. Dr. Ruth Berggren with UT Health San Antonio says there's promise in two clinical trials being conducted in Spain and Iran that might help ease the skepticism about the use of melatonin. They're giving those healthcare workers either two milligrams of melatonin at bedtime or a placebo or a sugar pill and they're monitoring them for 12 weeks and they're going to look to see if there's any difference in the rate of getting infected or if people do get infected. She warns people not to take melatonin in high doses without talking to their physician first. There's some evidence that if you take blood thinners or anticoagulants, or if you take medication for seizures, that the melatonin could interact with those. Neil says because supplements are not regulated, studies need to be done on correct dosage for different stages of the virus. He says melatonin won't kill the virus, but it seems to help manage the symptoms. Any medical personnel, anyone who would like to know more, discuss it, I'm more than open to talking to anyone about it there. I've seen that this has worked as as well as I thought it would. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Now to hydroxychloroquine. That's a drug that came back into the spotlight after the president posted a video about it on Twitter, fueling more controversy. Studies in June say the controversial anti-malaria drug said it was ineffective and potentially dangerous as a COVID-19 treatment. Here in San Antonio Methodist Hospital says a handful of doctors have and are prescribing it, although their advisory group does not endorse hydroxychloroquine. Doctors are allowed to make their own decisions. Meanwhile, Baptist and University hospitals used it early on, but stopped around June when the FDA revoked the emergency use authorization for the drug. Dr. Hagened with University Hospital and UT Health San Antonio is begging people to stop stockpiling the medicine for COVID-19 because patients with autoimmune disorders are actually in need of hydroxychloroquine and cannot get their medicine. Well, there is no doubt COVID-19 has had a major impact on local businesses, especially in the downtown area. Before the pandemic, the historic St. Paul Square was on a track towards revival. Now, business owners are struggling. The night team's Jaffney Gray with how they're not giving up, but instead trying to adapt to the new norm. Pursuing tenants right now is a bit of a challenge, um, but we're not giving up by any means. Michael Jerzin, who is the owner of the St. Paul Square SB project, says before COVID-19, no doubt business was booming. We had concerts booked, we had festivals. We're packed pretty much every day of the week. We're seeing multiple different types of weddings, graduations, or different events. When the pandemic began. It's impacted our permanent tenants, specifically um, the entertainment oriented tenants, the restaurants and the in the in the bars. A prime example of this is the three story 15,000 square foot smoke barbecue restaurant. Everything that I built my entire business around was around large groups coming together in tight spaces. So with social distancing um, and just the virus being out there, things changed dramatically. Today, the owner announced they will be downsizing to a new location down the street as a way of adjusting to the climate. And the site that we're creating there is going to be a small restaurant, but large outdoor dining space. Jerzin says their current tenants have found other creative and innovative ways to stay alive, like curbside services. I mean, we're hurt pretty bad, but we still did the curbside delivery. Then uh, we reopened uh, for dining when, when the government said we could, and it's been slow. The project owners also just completed a remodeled courtyard for restaurants and residents to use. Outdoor area where you can social distance 
in the immediate future and, and probably in the near future. Do I think that we're going to go back to normal anytime soon? I think we're in our new normal already. Daphne Gray, KSAT 12 News. A new on the night beat an argument between neighbors on the east side ending in a shooting. This happened at a home on Poinsettia that's near Walters in Houston. Police say a man and a woman were arguing when the woman left to bring someone else over. That's when guns were drawn and shots were fired. Officers say two men were shot, one man in his 40s, the other in his 30s. No word on what the argument was about. Police say they do have a person of interest in this case. Developing tonight, human remains found on the south side of the county. The sheriff's office saying the body was so decomposed they can't determine an age or a gender at the moment. The discovery was made by a man walking his dog earlier today. It happened on the 1500 block of La Soya Drive. That's just south of 281 and Loop 1604. Bear County deputies say the remains were found inside some barbed wire fencing. We've got a property owner here that's going to let us onto the property to, to kind of search around and see if there's any other evidence to be gleaned from that. The sheriff saying if you have a missing relative and think this might be them to contact the sheriff's department at 210-335-6070. Investigators are hoping to learn more about the case through forensic evidence. A woman dead from an overdose, her brother now accused of going after a group of people he believed were responsible for her death. One of those people was shot execution style. Police say 30 year old Rahelio Sanchez is charged with capital murder. He and another man are accused of kidnapping two men and a woman back on the 4th of July. One kidnapping victim who was able to get away told officers he was able to get away after a gun jammed, but a woman and another man were shot. The woman's body was found, but investigators have yet to locate the other victim. If you have any information in this case, call the SAPD homicide unit at 210-207-7635. It's still ahead on the night beat a massive fire spreading to six buildings leading to evacuations. The latest out of San Francisco coming up. And forget about toilet paper, the pandemic leading to aluminum cans being in high demand the impact on a brewery here in San Antonio. Plus, a couple faced with trouble on the water at a local lake. How a boater stepped in at, into action to help them out. Next on the Night Beat. New tonight, a couple capsized in their kayak and another boater jumping in to help. It happened at Bronig Lake Park. The area is near Calaveras Lake, but sits just off I-37 and Donop Road. Firefighters say the couple was on a kayak when they overturned at some point and could not right themselves. The woman was able to get free, but the man was still underwater. A passerby was able to pull the man from the water. When emergency crews arrived on scene, firefighters say they were able to stabilize the man and take him to Mission Trails Baptist Hospital. Well, just like manufacturers were not prepared for the rush of people buying toilet paper during the pandemic, aluminum can makers were not ready either. Aluminum cans are in high demand as people are choosing to drink at home and bars remain closed. The night team's Tiffany Huertas has a look at how this is impacting a local brewery. Draft sales across, across the country have dropped and you're seeing a spike in can sales. At Alamo Beer Company, located in the east side, brewmaster Greg Spickler believes more people are drinking at home during the pandemic. Well, a lot of folks are staying at home and drinking beer at home. Um, not so much going out to bars and restaurants anymore. Spickler says sleek cans are hard to find. We have a hard time getting our 12 ounce sleek cans because of the seltzer craze. Um, but as far as our 12 ounce uh, standard beer can, we're able to get those right now at the moment um, because we're getting a blank can and we're putting a label on it. Um, if we were a brewery who had a printed can, we would be experiencing some extremely long lead times. So in 2019, we had a shortage of some seltzers because they, they had planned to make only so much of it and demand had exceeded those plans. And here we are again in 2020 and demand has exceeded what they planned for. Lester Jones with the National Beer Wholesalers Association says with bars, restaurants and stadiums closed down and people still wanting to drink beer. That made a rush for packaged beer, which comes in bottles and cans. The pandemic forced the Alamo Beer Company to make difficult decisions, including letting go of some employees. 
Spickler says sales have gone down, but they are still offering curbside and selling products at HEB. It'd be great for the riots to go away and, and things to turn back to normal, but unfortunately I think we're going to see kind of an adaptation of what uh, the new normal is. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. The coronavirus leading to issues with unemployment, domestic violence, and poverty. There's also a potential for an increase in child abuse and neglect in our community. Tomorrow, KSAT 12 will be live streaming a KSAT Community Child Abuse Awareness Town Hall. It's from 2 to 3 in the afternoon. There will be a resource phone bank with the Children's Shelter. All right, I hope you enjoyed the little respite in temperatures and the yeah. rain that we got because July is back to being July. Oh, and look at that shot from yeah. Sky 12. Beautiful, too. That is a nice, nice shot, isn't it? At least we have that, right? Yeah, <laughs> beautiful shot of Sky 12 because, man, it has been hit or miss with the rainfall over the last few days. A lot of us missing out on the rain. And I want to start the forecast by talking about how dry this month has been. Although a lot of locations over the weekend received nearly two inches of rain. I'm thinking about Elmendorf, which received two inches of rainfall within Bear County. At the airport, we only received nine hundredths of an inch of rainfall from all of those scattered showers and storms that were around the city over the weekend. That is nearly two and a half inches, more than two and a half inches below the average for the month. And if we do not get any pop up showers right over the airport where the official sensor is, this will be the driest month we've had in five years since July 2015 when we saw seven hundredths of an inch of rainfall. And this month has kind of put us back a little bit. Since January 1st, we've had more than two, more than a foot of rain, but it's still about four and a half inches shy of what we normally have. And there was rain out there today, just nothing fell at the airport. Uh, we even had some good rainfall apart, across parts of the coastal plain, closer to uh, the Gulf of Mexico and parts of DeWitt County, about an inch inch of radar estimated rainfall near Gonzales, a similar story there. This is very usual for this time of year to get these quick pop up showers that dump about an inch of rain, and that was the case for parts of eastern Guadalupe County near Seguin, about an inch of radar estimated rain there and about an inch in northern Kendall County. But as you can see, nothing here in San Antonio uh, and we'll continue this trend. Tomorrow's going to be very similar to today. We were definitely hot 99 degrees for the high in San Antonio. That is three degrees above average, 100 in New Braunfels, 99 in Del Rio and in Catula as well. But at least we had a very beautiful sunset. This picture was uh, sent in through our KSAT Connect feature on our weather app. Uh, thank you so much to Ray for sending in that picture. Beautiful colors there uh, because of those showers that were out there to the west that allowed for a nice sunset. Now we have seen some pop up showers and storms because of this low pressure system over the valley and, and that's going to be the case tomorrow. That's why we'll see some more pop up showers and storms, but we're still under the influence of this big high pressure system. Thankfully, it's not over us right now, but even this late in the evening, it's still 108 degrees in Phoenix, Arizona. So yeah, that heat high, thankfully it'll stay at bay, but we'll still be hot tomorrow. And then as you can see on the future cast, more of the same pop up shower or storm tomorrow a high near 98 degrees. If you do happen to get one of those afternoon downpours, though, you'll be able to cool off from that rain cool there, but you'll consider yourself lucky for your Wednesday waking up at 77 degrees, mostly cloudy skies, 91 right around noon and then 98 for the afternoon high, only 20% chance for an isolated shower or storm south winds at 5 to 15. So at least we'll have a little bit of a breeze. Then we're going to see temperatures get up to the triple digits as we close out July. Notice that we have a bit of a dip in temperatures 97 on Saturday, still hot. But the reason for that is a summertime cool front, which is very rare. And as you can see, it's not much of a cool front, just dropping us by about three degrees. But it will allow for us to have another uptick in isolated showers and storms. We'll refine that forecast for you. But for now, you can keep your fingers crossed for the weekend. Will do. Thank you so much, Sarah. A less hot front. Mm -hmm. yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the Spurs have a little momentum going into this eight game stretch. And I think a little bit more confidence than they had in the last two games. Of course, they lost those, but today they did very well from start to finish. When we come back, and even with that new starting lineup, when we come back, the Spurs get a win against Indiana before really means business starting on Friday. And tonight we're saying goodbye to Bryce.
Patty Mills missing all three scrimmages. First head coach Greg Popovich calling him Manu Ginobili Jr. because of how he plays all out. More like El Contusion the second, saving him for the real thing, we hope. Final scrimmage against Indiana. DeMar DeRozan comes out firing. And how about Rudy Gay with a turnaround baseline shot? Spurs are down seven after one. Now in the second quarter, DeMar cuts it to four. And how about Rudy? Shows off the Spurs outside game with a big time three pointer. He was score 14 in the first half. The Spurs are only down one at the break, 60 to 59. Third quarter, Derek White, who got the start again today with a pick and roll to Yaka Purtle, part of a 15 to two run. Drew Eubanks with a big time block that starts Keldon Johnson on the break. He would finish at 21 points. Rudy with the alley oop to Eubanks, and guess what? Finally, Rudy led the Spurs with 23, including this exclamation point for the first win inside the bubble, 118 to 111. Will Hardy, who interviewed for the Knicks coaching job called the shots today for the Spurs and was asked about Johnson's performance. Keldon tonight was special with his energy. You know, he's a he's a really hardworking kid and, and brings a spark of, of energy and life when he comes off the bench. So uh, his defense tonight, him getting out in transition was huge for us. Before tip-off of the Spurs' final scrimmage, head coach Greg Popovich has asked about holding the restart inside the NBA bubble in Orlando, Florida. In particular, how he feels about the NBA's plan if there happens to be a problem that develops in the protective environment, while other sports, such as Major League Baseball, are struggling with multiple positive COVID tests. I have complete confidence in whatever scenario may come about. There are always you know, unintended consequences of whatever uh, logistics have been put into place, but... Uh, so far, uh, I, I don't think there's a safer place on earth, very honestly. If we do have something drastic happen like has happened in other leagues, uh, I have full confidence that they'll have a plan and tell us exactly what to do. All right, the restart for the Spurs starts on Friday against Sacramento at 7 p.m. The Los Angeles Lakers may be without one of their star players when they tip off the restart of the NBA season this Thursday against the Clippers. Anthony Davis did not practice with the team today after suffering an eye injury during Saturday's scrimmage against the Orlando Magic. He got poked in the right eye accidentally by Michael Carter Williams. Lakers head coach Frank Vogel officially lists Davis as day-to-day, -day, says they will just have to wait and see how well his vision improves today and tomorrow. Major League Baseball is facing a crisis that may shut down their season just six days into their modified 60-game schedule. Four more members of the Marlins have now tested positive, bringing the total to 17, and now their games have been postponed through Sunday. The Yankees' home opener against the Phillies has been now been postponed, and instead they will face the Orioles in Baltimore starting on Wednesday and will host the Red Sox in their home opener now on Friday. Baseball Commissioner Rob Manfred's decision to postpone the Marlins' games through Sunday comes after the Washington National players voted they did not want to go to Miami to play their three-game series against the Marlins this weekend. And at some point, Commissioner Manfred will have to make the decision on if the Marlins team can remain competitive. Saying goodbye to Bryce. Next. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. On the very first day of the Dallas Cowboys training camp in Frisco, they have re-signed defensive tackle Antoine Woods. Now, he's agreed to a one-year tender offer worth $750,000 after it appeared he and the Cowboys had parted ways, even though he has exclusive right free agent this offseason. Woods appeared upset when the Cowboys signed both Gerald McCoy and Don Terry Poe, even removing his any mention of the Cowboys from his social media platforms. But now he's back wearing the star. Number one draft pick quarterback Joe Burrows has agreed to a four-year contract worth $36.1 million to the Cincinnati Bengals with a signing bonus of almost $24 million due in one lump sum payment 15 days after the deal is signed. I'll be signing it tonight or earlier today. That's according to ESPN. The Bengals are hoping the Heisman Trophy winner and national college champion can lead Cincinnati out of the cellar in standings this season. Tributes are pouring in today. Following the death of 17-year-old Bryce Wisdom, the former Judson High School football player, lost his battle with cancer Sunday night after a two-year courageous fight. It's been becoming more and more evident how many lives he touched with his bravery, coining the phrases Bryce Strong and Live Like Bryce. And that was no more evident than it was today on the Rocket campus as people started adding to his memorial. The one thing that I think we can drive home is that uh, this shouldn't be about just um, just this week, you know, we have to continue with our with our sense of community, our sense of, of oneness and support each other F from now on. I mean, if, if this is something that that brought us together and that was the vehicle of Bryce's life and that's the purpose, then I think that we should continue with that and support each other throughout. And what a courageous young man to be that young, just a teenager, and be able to fight that fight and live his life the way he did, inspiring others. That just says a lot about that young man. I like how and I like what the principal said. Remember the feeling of togetherness for this one young man 
and just carry that forward. And it seems like we need it now more than ever, doesn't it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Greg. We've seen a change in area hospitals amid the pandemic. Up next, a live discussion with an emergency room doctor. It's coming up in our case at Q&A. Dr. Robert A. Froelichstein is an emergency room doctor. He's part of an independent group, but he works at Methodist Hospital. He joins us for our KSAD Q&A tonight. Doctor, thank you as always for what you're doing as a first responder, but also for joining us to answer some of our questions. I know throughout this pandemic, you have been concerned about people that need to be in an emergency room that don't have COVID-19, that are having chest pains, that are having you know other issues. Are you still concerned about that? Uh, yeah, I don't think it's as dramatic as as we experienced in March and April. But you know, our our, our census, our patient volume is not um, not back to where it should be at this time of the year. And so there are definitely people staying away. Again, I don't think it's to the levels. I know it's not to the levels we saw in in uh, April and March. Uh, but those people are still not coming. Yes. What What do you say to those people? I, I would say that uh, you know it's it's it is a scary time, but the the processes we have in place in the hospital, I think, um, will keep you safe. Um, I know they've kept me safe and they've kept my colleagues safe, and so I, I feel confident that they'll keep you safe, uh, much safer than sitting at home with an undiagnosed severe illness. We've heard so much about the hospitalization rates going up, going up. How are things today in the ER? Can you give us a sense of what it's like right now in the emergency room? Yeah, so we're still seeing, you know, plenty of COVID patients. Um, again, thankfully, I think most of them are, are not sick enough to, to be in the hospital. Um, those that are, though, seem to be a little more sick than uh, it was maybe a month ago. Of patients in our hospital system that are in the ICU versus in the non-ICU. You cut out there for a second, uh, Dr. Oh. Steiner. Repeat what you what you said at the end. It, it, you, we heard you up until the part where you said it seems like the symptoms are more like people are coming in sicker than they were, say, a month or two ago. Yeah, I apologize. Those that are the, those that are admitted seem to be a little more sick than they were, you know, those that we were admitting four weeks ago or six weeks ago. And I believe that's reflected in, uh, at least within the Methodist healthcare system, of a greater percentages of all admitted patients are in the intensive care unit. You talked about the the, the processes that are set up there to keep patients safe. Uh, we talked a little bit about this at six o'clock, but you're also struck with the fact that not a lot of your colleagues uh, and people that you work with have become sick from COVID-19. Is that correct? And why do you think that is? Uh, that is that is correct. And I'm so, so very thankful for it. That was certainly one of the, my big fears and still remains one of my big fears is that the, my colleagues, my friends um, will become ill. And then therefore, there won't be people to take care of you all when you need our help in the emergency department. I think it's a, um, a reflection of two things. One is the, the processes we have in place, early identification of those patients that might have COVID, kind of isolating them to separate areas, and then knowing that we need to protect ourselves when we, when we go in. And also, I think it's probably a little bit of a reflection on just, in general, healthcare workers seem to be taking the precautions that we all ought to take uh, to prevent the community spread of this virus seriously. What about the emotional and mental element to that? I imagine fatigue and the stress of the daily duties has got to be weighing on staff as well. Um, it, it definitely is. And it's certainly one of the one of the things that our group and, and our hospital system is very concerned about is the, the mental well-being of the staff and, and, the, and the physicians because um, this is not um, a sprint. I don't see this ending, you know, in the next few weeks. This is going to be months and months more. And uh, so we encourage each other to, you know, take time off and take mental breaks and do the best we can. Talk about hydroxychloroquine. It's something that's back in the news now. Your take on that drug and its effectiveness. Yeah, so uh, there's been multiple studies 
that really show that there is there is really no effect. Now, in vitro, in, in the test tube and in theory, it makes sense that it should probably help with this uh, with this virus. It helps prevent the virus from binding to where it needs to bind to to infect us. Um, that just hasn't been shown out in the literature. And so if, it, if you have a drug, there are no drugs, but if you had a, a treatment or a drug that had no side effects, no potential harm, then there's no harm in using that medication. But every medication has potential harm. And so when you have something with no unproven, bene no proven benefit, but known potential harm, it's really hard to recommend using that medication. You know, we've been talking so much about this recent surge and we, the large volume of patients that you've seen during this recent surge. And there's a lot of talk about the next surge. What are the long-term plans for not only your emergency rooms, but just emergency rooms in general to deal with that? I think it's to take the lessons that we've learned over the last several months on how to be creative with spaces, how to be creative with staffing, and how to be uh, flexible and maintaining that, maintaining the capacity to take care of the patients with COVID, uh, knowing that the volumes of COVID are probably going to wax and wane over the next several months, um, but still be able to maintain the critical functions, uh, that, the critical services that we provide for the community. People are still having heart attacks. People are still needing emergent surgeries, and we have to be able to continue to uh, take care of those folks. Dr. Robert A. Frolickstein, emergency room physician at Methodist. As always, doctor, we appreciate what you do and staying up late with us tonight. My pleasure. All right, take Thanks. care. Thank you. We'll be right back. Around America tonight, at least six buildings burned in a massive fire in San Francisco this morning. The five alarm fire also left one firefighter injured. The businesses impacted included a roofing supply company, an auto parts shop and a sheriff's department field operations building where ammo had to be pulled from the building. And employees at the VCA All Pets Hospital had to evacuate as well, grabbing Winston the ball python before leaving. Terrified, shaking. It was terrifying. Yeah, very scary. When we were leaving the hospital, you know, there's an upstairs, we could feel the heat in the, in the hospital. Mm. Firefighters do not know the cause of the fire. They're expected to remain at the scene for days. Several sharks seen off the coast of Long Island, New York. Lifeguards saying they believe they saw a bull shark which can grow from 7 to 11 feet long and weigh up to 500 pounds. Meanwhile, in Maine, a woman swimming off the shore of Bailey Island killed in a shark attack there. Kayakers brought the woman to shore where she was later pronounced dead. This the first shark incident in Maine in 10 years. And near Houston, a small plane crash in front of a Harris County home. It happened on the last leg of a training flight. The president of Anson Aviation in Sugarland says the pilot in training was supposed to land at three airports as part of a cross country flight scenario. None of the instructors were on board because the flight was required to be done solo as part of a commercial pilot course. The pilot and another passenger on board were injured and taken to the hospital. They survived, though. According to DPS, the plane lost power while flying 7,000 feet in the air. No other injuries were reported. Well, here at home, the World War II cannon believed stolen Sunday has been recovered by San Antonio police. It's back where it belongs outside an American Legion post on Fredericksburg Road. SAPD is working on making an arrest in the case. Jesse de Goyado says American Legion members are grateful, but still puzzled as to why it was taken. It was about 3 or 4 a.m. when the tow truck dropped off the missing cannon. Hours earlier, SAPD had called, saying what they found in a storage unit at 1604 in Bulverde was likely theirs. And I couldn't believe it. I was ecstatic. I said, oh, my God, yes, thank you. The first vice commander of the American Legion Alamo Post II, Carlos Mendes, says it's believed a tip about suspicious activity led to its discovery soon after that. I spoke to three different officers and each one of them was highly concerned. They went to it, 
and they found it. They tracked it down. Very impressive, says Mendes, since these American Legion members were skeptical they'd ever see it again. Part of an Eagle Scout project, the pair of World War II-era cannons had been restored six years ago. They'd been anchored down, yet the thieves cut the chains and dragged away one of them. It's not every day that you see a cannon rolling down the road. How it was hauled away is unknown, along with why it was taken. But having learned of the theft has been a wake-up call, they say, for other veterans groups around the country with similar static displays. They're very vulnerable to the theft, as you can see. We never thought this would happen. Shame on you for even taking it. That was yesterday. Now these veterans have this message. You really thought you could get away with something like this? Oh. Don't mess with veterans. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Don't mess with veterans. There you go. Well, it is a sign of the COVID times. Dominican University in California offering a new course called Coronavirus Contact Tracing 101. Marin County Health Director Dr. Lisa Santora says students get credit and all the job training while the county gets the help it desperately needs. Contact tracers, contact patients to establish a chain of exposure to COVID-19. Coronavirus cases continue to surge across the country as a second promising vaccine trial gets underway this week. Meantime, health experts are urging people to resist public gatherings. As ABC's Romina Puga reports, multiple outbreaks are now linked to specific social events. Health officials raising concerns as some Americans continue to ignore CDC and state guidelines urging social distancing and mask wearing, pointing to so-called super spreader events like this mass church gathering on a San Diego beach and a benefit concert in the Hamptons with hundreds of attendees. Governor Cuomo tweeting out this video saying I am appalled the Department of Health will conduct an investigation. A new report from the White House Coronavirus Task Force obtained by the New York Times urging 21 states with outbreaks to put more restrictions in place. We are still seeing significant outbreaks occurring from birthday parties, graduation parties, um, family reunions. President Trump once again downplaying the COVID-19 threat and spreading misinformation on a discredited treatment. Uh, many doctors think it is extremely successful the hydroxychloroquine. Joe Biden saying the country cannot fight the virus if they can't trust their president. And if a president repeatedly says things to you that are not true, and then there comes a time when they say, I have something that I think can cure you, but it could really hurt you. You're not going to listen to the guy who says, been lying to you. On Capitol Hill, Congress is working to hammer out a new stimulus bill. Republicans want to cut weekly unemployment payments down to $200 to start, saying the current payment discourages people from working. When you pay people not to work, what do you expect? But Democrats argue the new bill doesn't go far enough for Americans. And just a day after Moderna started its phase three vaccine trial, new evidence that it might act quickly. Seven of eight primates injected with the vaccine showed no detectable virus in their lungs just two days after exposure. I am cautiously optimistic that as we get into the late fall and early winter, we will have an answer and I believe it will be positive. And the newly kicked off baseball season struggling as the outbreak on the Miami Marlins team leads to postponed games all week, leaving many to wonder if the season has a future. In Colorado, Romina Puga, ABC News. Time to talk a little weather as we take a live look outside with live cam. July is almost over. Thank you. <laughs> it is, but <laughs> it's feeling like yes. July, August right now. Right. July is almost over. But August but, yes. is around the corner. Yeah. Yes. And August is actually our hottest month of the oh, season. No. So of the year rather. So we are in for another hot week and weekend as well. I want to show you just how hot this month of July has been though. Let's take a look at the month in review. All of those red squares there on the calendar, those are days that the temperature has been above average. Yeah, and we have been above average for all but two days just this past weekend when we had a little extra cloud cover and some rain from Hurricane Hannah. Other than that, it has been a very hot July. In fact, our average high temperature, 99.9 .9 degrees, that is above average by three degrees. And for the year so far, we have had 14 days 
at or above 100. We were almost there today, and I think we'll be able to see a few triple digits before we close out July here. One good thing today was that some people got some rain, and we had a beautiful sunset. This is a look at the time lapse right around 830. That's when we had that beautiful sunset. Lots of nice colors there. Because of some storms off in the distance, you can even see those high, uh, tall clouds out there against the backdrop of the sunset. But it was hot, 99 degrees for the high, just 4 degrees shy of a record set back in 1995. Morning low in the upper 70s and will be in the upper 70s as we start the day tomorrow as well. Thankfully, with the loss of the sun, we're starting to see more comfortable temperatures out there. It's 81 degrees in San Antonio and it's 85 in Del Rio, 79 in Rock Springs and 79 in Gonzales. Like I said, temperatures are not going to budge too much from where they're at right now by the time we start the day tomorrow. And I've been calling this weather pattern a deja vu weather pattern because just about every day has been the same. We've had isolated showers and storms. Uh, this was a look at the radar from earlier today. Rained in some places, just not in downtown San Antonio. It rained out near uh, Seguin and in parts of northern Kendall County and out west toward Eagle Pass. But here in San Antonio, we did stay dry. We'll continue to see that shot for an isolated shower storm because of a low pressure system over the Rio Grande Valley. That's not great news for them. They don't need any more rain, but it looks like they're going to continue to see more rainfall uh, over the next few days. Instead, we'll see a high pressure system that will keep our rain chances at bay uh, other than a few isolated showers and storms, which is what we'll see tomorrow. Waking up at 77 with mostly cloudy skies, but that's a muggy 77. You're going to feel every degree tomorrow morning because of the high humidity. 91 for the lunchtime temperature, 98 for the afternoon high. Breezy at times, south winds at 5 to 15. We got to talk about the tropics because there is another system there that's starting uh, to brew just to the east of the Lesser Antilles out in the Atlantic. This is potential tropical cyclone number nine. It's almost a, a tropical storm. When it develops into a tropical storm, it'll become tropical storm Isaias, and it is expected to stay a tropical storm, but bring tropical storm wind conditions to Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, the Greater Antilles, and eventually Florida. The good news is here in Texas, we won't have to deal with Isaias. Now, look at the forecast over the next few days. Triple digits, 100 on Thursday and Friday as we close out July, and then on the weekend, little hope for some isolated showers and storms. I was talking to meteorologist Justin Horn earlier today, and Saturday's looking more promising, so we'll keep our fingers crossed for rain then. Okay. That would be great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sarah. Still ahead, no sleep, no problem. New laboratory robots are helping speed up the results for a specific type of test amid this pandemic. How it works coming up. And we are following several consumer headlines, including a transformation in the milk market and a change in the consumer electronics show in Las Vegas. It's coming up next on the Night Beat. Casinos and big shows are often a big draw for Las Vegas, but so is a yearly event that brings the next big technology to center stage. This year, the Consumer Electronics Show will be online only. Organi organizers say it is not possible to safely gather tens of thousands of people in Las Vegas for their showcase of inventions. So the all-digital event will happen in January 2021 with an online platform to share ideas and products instead. A hybrid of a digital and in-person show is scheduled for the following year in Las Vegas. America's milk industry is seeing some major changes. Major retailers like Kroger and Walmart have now built their own bottling plants. The Wall Street Journal says that allows them to cut prices to levels traditional bottlers can't match. As a result, two of America's biggest dairy producers were sold this year after filing for bankruptcy and closed several processing plants across the country. There's been a lot of talk lately about COVID-19 testing delays, but there's a new technology to help with one specific test. And the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention say it may help medical professionals better respond to the pandemic. This is our ser serology test, is the, the orange uh, part of the graph from Arizona to Florida. What we've seen is we've seen a pretty significant increase in the percentage of people testing positive for antibodies. And in all states in between, serology tests have become important 
helping each region of the U.S. estimate what percentage of Americans have been infected with the coronavirus. Results are important in detecting infections with few or no symptoms, which in turn can help scientists better monitor and respond to the pandemic. Well, now the CDC has unveiled laboratory robots to help get results from those antibody tests more quickly. From the loading of the sample through the detection of antibodies, the robot can test more than 3,600 samples a day, compared to about 400 samples a public health scientist can test in that same time period. The CDC says the robots will improve antibody testing capacity and allow for more data to help in the fight against COVID-19. An antibody test looks for the presence of specific proteins made in response to infections. I also want to add out that, that a pinprick blood sample isn't usually how you get the accepted antibody test results from. Coming up next, with students facing a digital divide, one teacher is using his creativity to help bring the classroom to his students. All right, talk about going above and beyond. Take a look at this. One teacher stepping up for his sixth grade students. The novel coronavirus closed Guatemala's schools in March. That's when this teacher used his savings to buy a used tricycle that you see there. He added plastic and a whiteboard and started visiting his students outside their homes for individual socially distanced lessons. He tries to visit each of his students twice a week. It's a solution to a sharp digital divide where only 13% of the province actually has access to the internet. That's amazing that he's doing that. A tricycle wow. mobile classroom. See you tomorrow.